Hello, welcome to another program from Maine Historical Society. I'm Kathleen Newman, and it is January 17th, 2024. And this is our book talk on uh, Charles Fletcher Dole, Liberal Theology and Reform, A Life Well Lived with author Paul T. Berlin. Uh, before we get into the content of tonight's program, uh, we'll start the way we always do, just by remembering that excuse me, Maine Historical Society recognizes that what is currently referred to as Maine is Wabanaki homelands, a place the Wabanaki have stewarded for over 13,000 years. We recognize the inherent sovereignty of the Abenaki, Maliseet, Mi'kmaq, Passamaquoddy, and Penobscot nations within these lands and waters. Understanding Wabanaki history is vital to understanding Maine, and we're committed to helping provide education about this history through partnerships with Wabanaki people. As I said, tonight's talk um, is on this new book about Charles Fletcher Dole. Uh, he was an author, a speaker, um, a theologian, minister, um, who went to Harvard uh, and advocated for improved civic education, women's suffrage, temperance, anti-imperialism, pacifism. So how did he become someone with such uh, you know, he had a very much more like con conservative and traditional background. So how did he come to this radical intellectual and theological cool. journey? So that's what our guest, um, Paul, is here to talk about this evening. Paul T. Berlin is Professor Emeritus of History at the University of New England, where he taught for 27 years. He was founding chair of the Department of History. And his first book, Imperial Maine and Hawaii, was published in 2006 and traced and interpreted the roles of 19th century Mainers who helped first colonize and then annex the islands. In 2012, he co-edited The Role of the American Board in the World, a volume which alludicated the 200 year history of the Congregational Church's missionary organization. Uh, Paul has an AB in philosophy from Heidelberg College and a PhD in American history from Rutgers. Paul, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Well, thank you and thank uh, the people who are attending on this cold night in Maine. Um, so the picture that you see before you is uh, the Reverend Charles Fletcher Dole, subject of my book. And um, this picture, I don't know, I don't have a precise date for it, but I found it in a Boston newspaper in 1901. So probably around the turn of the 20th century. So he was probably around in mid fifties at that point. And at that point he was at the absolute pinnacle of his, um, uh, his public persona and presence, even though he would continue to be very publicly engaged for the rest of his life. At this point in time, he was a prolific author. He had published probably seven or eight books and literally, and I'm not exaggerating, hundreds of articles, letters to newspapers, tracts and sermons. Um, some of his books dealt with social, political and economic issues at the time. Others articulated uh, the liberal theology that he had landed in. And I'll talk a bit about that a little bit later. He was also uh, president of the 20th Century Club in Boston. He was president of it for 13 years. It was probably the, and he helped found it in the, in the 1890s, probably the most high profile um, organization in Boston at the time to bring together leading intellectuals, artists, politicians to talk about the, the burning issues of the day. Um, as I'll talk about later, he was an anti-imperialist and he, went to had a, a, an audience with William McKinley in the Oval Office to try to persuade him not to go to war with Spain. Of course, he wasn't successful in that regard. My point was he had a very high profile at the time and uh, was engaged in civic education. His book, The American Citizen, which first published in 1891, sold over 100,000 copies and was adopted by school systems throughout the country. So that's sort of where he was. And what I want to talk about is how he got there and where he started. But before I do any of that, uh, I need to talk a little bit about how he came to my attention in the first place. Because while he had this very high profile in Massachusetts and to some extent in the country, um, 
He fell into absolute historical obscurity upon his death in 1927. But as um, Kathleen mentioned uh, a number of years ago, time flies, it's almost 20, I did publish the book titled Imperial Maine and Hawaii. And I traced the role that various Mainers played in the 19th century, first in the colonization and then in the annexation of the Hawaiian Islands. And in the process of doing that, I ran across the Dole family for the first time. And here is Daniel Dole, who was Charles's uncle, who went in 1840 to Hawaii with his wife, Emily Ballard. And he was a missionary there for the rest of his life. So that was, and I talked about other Mainers who played different roles. They went there as missionaries. His wife, unfortunately, uh, did not live very long. Um, uh, they had two children, and in complications uh, due to birth complications with the birthing of the second child, Sanford Ballard Dole, she died. Here's an image of Sanford Ballard Dole, Charles's first cousin, obviously my picture much later. And Sanford was at the absolute epicenter of the colonization the overthrow of the Hawaiian monarchy, which uh, my sister-in-law reminded me, occurred 131 years today, January 17, 1893. So it's pretty fitting to be talking about Dole's today. In any case, he was involved with that. Charles, on the other hand, had no direct role in Hawaii, but I, I bumped into him when I was doing the research on the Dole's. And because I found out early on that he had opposed American um, involvement in World War I, which was a very risky thing to do uh, in that period. It was in the back of my mind for a future project. So I began the project on him in 1919, uh, 2015. In any case, let's proceed on, on Charles. So here's an image of Nathan Dole, Charles's father, and Carolyn Fletcher Dole, his mother. Nathan grew up in Skowhegan, went to Bowdoin College, and then on to the very conservative Bangor Theological Seminary. And in um, after graduating, he was ordained across the Penobscot River in Brewer, and that's where Charles was born in 1845. His father was the minister of the Congregational Church there in Brewer. His mother was from Norwich Walk, not far from Skowhegan. Nathan died fairly early. He died in 1855 in his early 40s. And Carolyn then retreated with Charles. And they had two children by, the, by this time. Charles and uh, Charles had a younger brother also named Nathan. She retreated back to Norridgewa to live with her mother, Charles's grandmother, Sally Ware Fletcher, in the Dole home along the banks of the Kennebec River there in Norridgewa. Sadly, that dull building, that dull house burned to the ground in 2008. But this is where Charles Norwich Park, which is a small town then, uh, smaller, even smaller now, grew up and they had their initial education. I don't know quite how their education was financed because the widow uh, Dole and her mother didn't have a lot of resources, but both Charles and his brother, his brother later, were able to matriculate at Harvard College. And here's an image of Charles while he was a student at Harvard. He entered Harvard in 1864 and graduated in 1868. He had a stellar academic career. He was second in his class and graduated summa cum laude. And I'll come back to that a little bit, a little bit later. Upon graduation in 1868, he taught for a year in the Boston area and then entered the equally conservative theological seminary, Andover Theological Seminary, the first seminary in the United States. He graduated from that in 1872. Following year, he married his sweetheart, Francis Drummond. Francis's father, James Dr Drummond, was born and grew up in Bristol, Maine. He also went to Bowdoin and was actually Nathan Dole's roommate at Bowdoin. And then he and Nathan both went on to Bangor Theological Center. When they graduated and Nathan went to Brewer, James went to Lewiston. And that's where Francis was born in 1846. 
They were married in Brunswick, Maine in 1873. And in that same year, Charles received a call to the Plymouth Congregational Church, shown here in Portland, Maine. No longer exists. I'm not sure exactly where in Portland it was. I believe it was along Congress Street, sort of in the vicinity of where the Portland Museum of Art is now. But in any case, he was minister there from 1873 to 1876. And during that short tenure, he and Francis established a family tradition that they would adhere to for the rest of their lives. And that was taking their vacations down on Mount Desert Island. And in the summer of 1875, they went, took their vacation in Bar Harbor. And it was custom at that time, Bar Harbor was becoming a, a summer colony for the, the, the elites along the Eastern seaboard. And it was customary at that time for vacationing clergy, if they were inclined, to preach at this little church, this non-denominal church. It was called the White Church or the Union Church in Bar Harbor. And in the summer of 1875, Charles did just that. And it so happened that several of the attendees that day were parishioners of the First Congregational Society of Jamaica Plains, the neighborhood of Boston, a Unitarian church. And they must have been impressed by what they heard that summer Sunday in Bar Harbor because the very next year, Charles got an invite traveled to Jamaica Plain and preach at this church, church this church still stands. And he did that and he got a call, uh, an invitation to become their minister, which he did. He began ministry there in 1876 for, and he continued to be their minister for 40 years until 1916 when he retired. He then um, was granted emeritus status, which he enjoyed uh, for the next 11 years of his life dying at the family home in Jamaica Plain in 1927. While Charles and Francis were, well, they spent their lives essentially in Jamaica Plains, but summered every year in, uh, on Mount Desert Island, they built a cottage um, in Southwest Harbor, which unfortunately was demolished some years ago, quite a few years ago. In any case, while they were in Jamaica Plain, they raised a family. They had four children. A daughter, their first daughter died in infancy, and then they had, this is their image of their first son, James Dole and Charles. James was born in 1877, so it looks to be about three years old. So this is probably 1880, and Charles is in his mid-30s. They subsequently had two other children. The young girl here who uh, is standing was Winifred Dole, who went on to marry Horace Mann III, the grandson of the Horace Mann of Massachusetts reform fame. And then the little boy in the uh, chair, their last son who went to sea as a common seaman in night in um, when he was 16 and sadly contracted some sort of disease when they docked in China. And on the return voyage, his maiden voyage, his return voyage to San Francisco, he died and was buried at sea. So very, very sad uh, for the family. Here's an image of Francis and James when James was a little older, I don't know, 10 or 11 here. And here's a picture of James probably in the 1930s. And guess what? He has a lay around his neck. This is a picture in Honolulu because in 1899, James left Southwest Harbor where he had summered with his family and went off to Hawaii and two years later founded the Dole Pineapple Plantation, which ultimately grew into, of course, the Dole fruit company. A little bit more on that later. And here's a few pictures of Francis. And then this last picture of Charles is probably during the last, probably the last year of his life. Okay. Let's go back to this picture. Now, I love this picture. If you, I don't tell you, it's symbolic to me. If you look at this business, Daniel, again, who went off to Hawaii as the missionary. If you sense from this picture that this individual was pretty tightly wound, you're on the money. And his visage here, if you will, is symbolic to me of the religious, the, the religious environment and milieu into which Charles was born. 
And it wasn't just his uncle, it was his father, it was the rest of the members of his family and many Mainers at the time. It was a religious perspective that Charles would later call ultra-Orthodox. And what was it? In essence, it was Calvinist. Now, Calvinists believe a lot of things, but some of the most important are humanity, humankind is divided into two groups. The saints, who are the elect, and everybody else, the sinners. No doubt the group I would remember. And the real kicker is this is a matter of predestination. So your fate as a sinner, as, as, as the elect, as a saint, who's going to enjoy paradise after this life, or the other side, the sinners who are going to you know, burn in hell for eternity, is all preordained. There's nothing you can do to affect your fate. However, it's possible to get an inkling of what your fate might be if you have a conversion experience typically a, an emotionally tumultuous one, where you have received the arbitrary gift of God's grace that are among the elect. But the kicker is you can never be certain that it was an authentic conversion experience because the devil never lets up. And what you took to be a conversion experience that was authentic may not have been. Needless to say, if you believe these kinds of things, and they did, it's a very dark, anxiety-provoking world to live in and a worldview to, 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 to have. And Charles, very uncomfortable with this as a young boy, and he wrote about it later. I'll give you a couple of examples. He talked about his paternal grandmother and his aunt. Um, Daniel and his father, Nathan, had a, had a sister, Elizabeth, both of whom, late in their lives, as the, you know, the grave was looming, went into a profound state, what we today would call profound clinical depression, because they were convinced that they were not among the elect. Charles made, testified to, as well as his father, being put to bed by their mothers on occasion and be told to prepare for an early death. Maybe they might die before the end. <laughs> now, needless to say, these are not child-rearing practices we for today, but with that worldview, that was viewed as something that you should do to help, you know, to, to help your child's spiritual development or whatever. Then what happened? This is another part of the Calvinist view. What happened? What was the fate? Infants that died in infancy. Charles later would recall, we'd call this the nightmare that hung over many New England families. So Charles really chafed at this from the time he was a little boy. He talks about this in his memoir. Uh, he was emotionally distraught about it. His mother was just as severely Calvinist as her former husband had been, didn't know what to do about it. And she would admonish him to tell him to go off into the New Ridgewalk Cemetery between church services on Sunday, reflect on the gravestones and reflect on his fate and what, where he stood with God, etc. Needless to say, this was not, uh, he chafed at it. He had a terrible time with it. So where did he end up? And unfortunately, I was not able to document the chronological and and intellectual development of, of Dole's theology, because he never wrote about it that way. He never wrote about his theology systematically, and he never wrote about it chronologically. So I had to talk about where he started and where he ended. Where he ended was in a very different place. For the wrathful, Old Testament, angry, judgmental God, he substituted a God of love and goodwill that was at the heart of the universe. And Dole often talked about the universe being divine. And he believed that God had a plan for humanity. And that plan was one from evolution from barbarism and pestilence and warfare to a spiritually and morally and civilizationally superior state. And it was the moral obligation of someone, 
to align their wills with God's wills, to move that progression along. And so that is where he ended up. And the question is, how did he get there? And what I was sort of able to, not sort of, what I pieced together, and I, I assume it's accurate, was one that the temperamentally he just could not tolerate the, the, the dark religious perspective in which he was born. But he commented on the fact that it didn't affect his younger brother at all. He was not affected emotionally at all by this dark view. Secondly, you know, when you went off to Cambridge in Massachusetts, you went into the epicenter of religious liberalism at the time. The Unitarians had, you know, bubbled up in the late 18th century. They'd taken over Harvard by 1808. They founded their uh, uh, association in 1825. So that's where religious theological liberalism was. And then there was Darwinism. Go went to uh, Harvard between 1864 and 1868. On Origins of Species was published in 1859, only a few years beforehand. And Darwinism and evolutionary thinking was a major topic of discussion among faculty and students at the time he was there. And he bought into the Darwinian view of evolution very early. In fact, because he had a, such an exemplary academic career, he was granted the privilege of a short disquisition at, uh, at uh, graduation in 1868. And guess what? This was called the Darwinian theory. And he basically argued that he bought the idea that human beings had evolved from lower species and contrary to what people were saying at the time, that this undermined the dig dignity of humankind and undermined the dignity of God. He didn't buy that at all. So very early on, he accepted Darwinism at the biological level, but more, maybe more importantly, is the idea of evolution and progress in history and one's moral obligation to do that, to help that along and bring the kingdom of God to fruition in earth is what motivated him, him for the rest of his life. And that was that theological perspective was the funk, if you will, the inspiration for all of the social gospel reforms that he engaged in from roughly, you know, the late 19th century through the progressive era in American history. So among reformers in the progressive era, there was a political spectrum, some much more liberal, even radical than others. I've positioned Dole and, and the social gospelers were a subset of progressive reformers, I would, I positioned all in the, the sort of moderate conservative end of reform. The left wing of social gospel was uh, Christian socialism, and Dole never stopped writing in opposition to socialism. In fact, he was still writing about it in the last year of his life. So a lot of his reforms, not all of them, but a lot of his reforms were on the more moderate to conservative end of, of the continuum of reform. So let me talk about a little bit of the few of those reforms, not all of them, because I don't want to go beyond 30 to 35 minutes. Civic education. I told you he had this one book, he wrote several books for basically civics textbooks for public schools. Um, part of his motivation was immigration. Dole was very much uh, supportive of immigrants. He was not a xenophobe, and nativism was bubbling up and from the 1880s on. It was pretty ugly. Dole was very welcoming to immigrants. At times, he thought that the volume of immigration was too high. But he also argued, you know, the immigrants are coming many times to oppress people from, from countries that are not democracies, and they get here, and they don't really understand their rights, nor, more importantly, from his perspective, do they understand their obligations. And so he wrote books both for the native you know, native born population, but also for immigrants. And so that, that was education to him was, you know, education was the me the, the his his default place for reform. He was also a temperance advocate. Very, very visible, very vocal about this. He talked about growing up in the house uh, in New Ridgewalk, all the decanters were empty. So his mother and his grandmother were temperance advocates. 
The fact that there were even decanters in the house had led me to believe that maybe Charles's grandfather, who had died long, be long, long before Charles never knew him, maybe he was not quite so abstemious. But in any case, Charles admitted to drinking somewhat until he got to Jamaica Plain. When he got to Jamaica Plain, he got involved with a, a, a local organization called the Friendly Society. It was an upper middle class, fairly paternalistic organization that brought in voluntary contributions and then distributed them to the worthy poor of Jamaica Plain and surrounding neighborhoods. And Dole saw in his capacity with that organization, and he was an officer of it for many years, the deleterious impact that alcohol could have on people particularly the impact it had on women and children of abusive husbands. And so he wrote a little uh, pamphlet, said uh, what converted me, and he argued for absolute abstemiousness, prohibition in essence. However, you know, he basically said, look, some people can handle alcohol fine, others can't. Let us, they can handle alcohol well, it's not a, a problem for us, give it up as an example to those who can't. Again, persuasion, his technique was his, his go-to for reform. However, and this is very interesting, he did not support the constitutional amendment, the prohibition amendment. He thought that was not the way to affect societal change, at least in this case and in most other cases. Education, persuasion, build a consensus. He said he wrote in the early 20s, once the prohibition, prohibition was in effect, and he saw some of the deleterious consequences. He said, this is not the way you do it. A big segment of the American population doesn't want this, and to foist them on it is not right. And then he cited some of the consequences of it that we're all aware of, rise of organized crime, sort of a cynicism towards the law, turning neighbors as spies, you know, spying on their neighbors, or all of that kind of thing. He thought this was... Prohibition's appropriate, but that's not the way to go about it. Gender. He, he was embarrassed that he came to support of women's suffrage relatively late, but he had he had gotten religion, so to speak, in 1895, and then became a pretty a pretty uh, frequent um, advocate and speaker uh, um, on uh, for women's suffrage. However, and this is where he sort of, again, positions sort of on the moderate to conservative end of reform. He said, historically, you know, women were treated as drudges or as ornaments, and both of these are wrong. And he lauded the fact that, you know, he, he, he wrote a, 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 a small book about this whole issue in 1900, lauded the fact that women were getting opportunities to go to college and university and venturing into some occupations outside the home, et cetera. But he really thought that, and he said this very explicitly, for most women, probably the best role is in the home as a mother, or if stepping outside, the nurturing professions. Now, this is interesting because as president of the 20th Century Club, he rubbed shoulders with a good number of young women were not being bound by those constraints. Most significantly was Emily Green Bosch. Now, Emily was a little girl when he took over this, the, uh, the church in Jamaica Plain, and she was a parishioner of his all the way up through, you know, until she went off to college. She went off and graduated in the first class at Bryn Mawr, then went to graduate school and earned a PhD and became an economics professor in, at Wesley. In 1946, long after Dole had died, she was the second woman to be awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. She referred to Dole as my mentor and inspiration. However, for Dole, this kind of model of what women do was more the exception than the rule. So he was ambivalent at best about the gender currents that he experienced thought that women should have more opportunities, but there was a major qualification, caveats, if you will. Race. Sometime in the 1880s, Dole made the acquaintance of Booker T. Washington. 
Washington founded Tuskegee Institute in July 4th, actually, July 4th, 1881. And he would come up north to, you know, hit up uh, philanthropists to support his school. And it's, at some point in the 18, 18, early 18, late 1880s, early 1890s, he made Dole's acquaintance. Dole didn't have a lot of money to give himself. He was comfortably upper middle class, but he rubbed shoulders with lots of people who could contribute significantly to Tuskegee Institute. And so he went on the board of Tuskegee in 1893 and stayed on it for 20 years. But Dole also had a relationship with W.E.B. Du Bois. He had both Booker T. Washington speak at the 20th Century Club and Du Bois speak at the 20th Century Club. And Du Bois and Washington were at loggerheads over the methods by which Af African Americans should pursue to improve their status to get the full rights of citizenship. Booker T. Washington focused on manual and industrial education exclusively in his school. Du Bois was an advocate for higher education, university and college education for a segment of African-American population. In fact, he wrote a very famous pamphlet to target it directly at Washington called The Talented Tenth. He basically said, African-Americans have to, some segment has to go to college and university. There's there no pool of instructors to draw on for your very school. They were at loggerheads where Booker T. Washington would not challenge the political structures, economic political structures in the South. Du Bois was much more militant. Dole had a good relationship with both. Du Bois at one point said he loved and admired Dole. However, in 1914, they had a somewhat of an ugly dust up in the pages of the crisis. Crisis was the um, publication of the NAACP in those days and Du Bois was uh, the editor. I won't get into the details of the, of the disagreement, but essentially Du Bois said, Dole is naive. He thinks his ethic of goodwill. So Dole always believed if you conducted yourself in goodwill towards anyone, the result would be a reciprocal response. And Du Bois said, you know, that's probably true in a lot of areas in the South. It's not true in the South with the racist white power structure there. So they had a real disagreement. And uh, I think in the, pa in the paper, Dole would respond and Du Bois would write back. And it was, um, I think, a Dole pretty much went silence on race, silent on race after that. I think his feelings actually were, were hurt. But again, here's an example of he, he was very interested in improving the circumstances of African Americans, but was much more closely aligned to Booker T. Washington than he was to Du Bois. Where he was less conservative was in the issue of foreign policy. He was a vociferous anti-imperialist. I mentioned how he had gone to see McKinley personally to try to stave off the Spanish-American War. And he despised the American empire that was constructed, constructed in the wake of that war, specifically the grisly guerrilla war that the US prosecuted against the Filipinos and colonizing those islands. He was constantly speaking on stages, writing against this awful endeavor by the United States. But there's a little qualification in here too. And that was Hawaii. Hawaii was annexed in the wake of the Spanish-American War. And he was, Dole, Hawaii was a conundrum for, for Dole. He claimed that he opposed what his first cousin did, overthrowing the Hawaiian monarchy. But he never said anything at the time publicly because he would he had a very uh, a high sense of decorum. He would never have embarrassed his first cousin in public. But later he wrote that he had disagreed with him. But his disagreement, again, there was a qualification here. What he seems as I dug into it, what I think he disagreed with was not that the Hawaiian monarchy was replaced, but the way it was replaced. It was through a revolution albeit a bloodless, bloodless revolution, but he would have preferred that there had been a broad-based discussion in Honolulu with all the various factions there to come up with a consensus to replace what Dole did call, 
Charles now, not Sanford, Dole called the preposterous Hawaiian native monarchy. So he, he thought the, the monarchy should be replaced. He disagreed with the means by which his cousin did it. So that's a fairly qualified portrait of a anti-imperialist. Lastly, and I only have a few more minutes because I don't allow time for questions, there was no qualifications on his views on World War I. He was a, a categorical, became a categorical pacifist. Um, he was a member of and an officer of the Massachusetts Peace Society and the American Peace Society. And in June of 1950, just a month after the Germans had sunk the Lusitania, there was a movement in the United States under the rubric of preparedness. TR is running around. Not, this was when TR really went off the rails, um, calling for enhancing the military budget, which Dole had always opposed, and military training for boys in public schools, et cetera. And Dole had a major problem with the fact that the peace societies of which he was a member, and one of which he was an officer, supported this. And he wrote a scathing pamphlet, basically, what good is a peace society that's only for peace in times of peace? And so he looked around for um, a, a peace society that was categorically opposed to war, and he couldn't find one, so he founded his own in 1915, the Association to Abolish War. And throughout the war, opposed Americans' involvement, in it, you know, up to Americans' involvement, and then he opposed the war, and then Americans' involvement in it. And he took his fair share of abuse. Now, he wasn't jailed like Eugene Debs and other were, but he did take a fair share of his abuse. One of the most painful being that in November of 1917, the men's club of the church that he had served faithfully for 40 years and which had granted him his emeritus status, voted unanimously against pacifists, slackers, and all those that oppose American involvement. The war. It had to be a stinging public rebuke. With the end of the war and uh, in the in the 1920s, I think Dole moved a little bit to the left. He advocated for a second trial for Sacco and Vanzetti when Margaret Sanger was denied uh, by the mayor of Boston uh, the right to speak on birth control from a from a Boston to from a public uh, city facility. He petitioned against that. Um, there's one other thing I wrote about. Oh, uh, uh, Eugene Debs. So Eugene Debs was pardoned by uh, Warren Harding, but his full uh, political rights were not restored. He advocated for that. So I, he moved a bit to the left in the late last years of his life. And he was still campaigning for outlawing war and peace up to two weeks before he died. He was quite fatigued in the fall of 1927, and his doctor said, you know, you really ought to take some rest, and he laid down in his bed in Jamaica Plains and never got up. So he died in November of, of, of that year. Quickly, why do I think, why did I add that little subtitle, A Life Well Lived? Well, I think you may have gleaned, I'm not, I was, I'm, my, this book is not uncritical of Dole, but on balance, I think he lived quite an exemplary life. His consistent public engagement to improve the world, as he saw it in his vision of that, was of course qualified, all, all of us. And his emphasis on civic discourse and uh, uh, collegial engagement with those that you disagree with, even when you're being abused for your opposition to World War I. It's something, as you know, look around today, read the New York Times, it's severely lacking. And so, you know, on balance, I think he lived a life that uh, was exemplary. And there were more, if there were more like him, uh, we might be well better than we are today. I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Um, that was really interesting. And we're getting some questions from the audience, but I wanted to start off the questions with, so this individual, in a lot of ways, you know, so ahead of his time, um, connected to a lot of interesting uh, people and interesting ideas. Why is it that 
someone like myself had never heard of him until your you know, book is that's published. A, yeah, it's a good it's a good question. I mean, he fell in total, you know, I feel like I resurrected him. <laughs> um, and this book is largely a, a book of historical recovery. Well, I suspect it's because you know, he was a Unitarian minister, and I really haven't talked mm -hmm. about you know, that that much. Um that's a that's a relatively small denomination. Mm -hmm. And even though he had a very high profile in Boston at the time and through the Unitarian Network throughout the nation, um, that probably has something to, to do with it. Um, plus, you know, when he died, the, the, the 1920s, you know, was very much of a reaction to some of the, the, the liberal, the progressive era. So that may have had something to do with it. So sure. I really don't, you know, I, I can't answer it more yeah, than that. Just one of those, just kind of one of those things. And actually someone's asking, can you say more about how he moved from his Calvinist past to Unitarianism? Was he influenced by transcendentalism at all? Yeah, no, he, a... yeah, so he was. I mean, he was a big fan of Emerson. And um, so the, the Unitarians, um, uh, you know, they, they, they didn't believe in the, first of all, they didn't, didn't believe in the Trinity and they didn't believe in the divinity of, of, of Jesus. And, and Dole certainly agreed with that. But the Unitarians had a split in the 1860s. Um, some continued under the Christian mantle and others tacked off and formed something called the Free Religious Society, which would have no creed whatsoever was uh, not Christian, et cetera, et cetera. And Dole eventually joined that organization later, much later. And actually he was an officer in that. Um, no, he was definitely influenced by um, the transcendentalist. And, you know, their, Emerson's tack uh, and other was that the church got it wrong very early on. The message was, Jesus had a message. That was the story. But they ended up shifting the focus onto Jesus himself and his divinity, et cetera. And that was a huge mistake. And Dole didn't say those things exactly, but clearly agreed as well. And he was very um, open to ecumenical. He wanted a, he didn't like denominational lines. He wanted a broad church that included anybody of goodwill, including atheists and agnostics in a church to to worship if they felt like they should could worship, and it didn't matter who they worshiped. He thought somebody who was a Buddhist was on the same plane, a devout Buddhist on the same plane as a Christian, same plane as a Unitarian. So he had a very, um, so I don't know if that answers your question or, or the, the, uh, the attendance uh, mm -hmm. question or not. But no, he was influenced by the transcendentalists, definitely. And that free religious society that, that broke off in the Unitarians, the first subscription first subscriber to that organization was Ralph Waldo Emerson. Mm. Someone else is asking, Dole wrote of progress not going in a straight line, um, but that justice and goodwill would prevail over, quote, self-centered individualism. People were coming to understand that kindness or good is the mightiest force in the world, does this thinking link up in some way um, with what later uh, leaders, teachers like Gandhi, Martin, Martin Luther King, um, are they kind of are they drawing on him at all? Um, that's a good question. I don't think so because he found, he fell into such um, historical obscurity after he died. Mm -hmm. When he died, interestingly though. A, another Unitarian minister who was a world peace advocate and a strong supporter of independence for India referred to Dole as America's Gandhi. Oh, wow. That is interesting. The same person's also asking, can you comment on Dole's poem, Baker's Island? Well, so that's a poem he wrote um, I stumbled across it at Harvard Divinity School and it had no date on it, but it clearly was written by a man, an older man, because he's talking about it, you know, not being too far from, from death. And then I found a copy of it with a date on it at, at a, a museum in Honolulu. And um, I included it as, a, as an afterthought um, because uh, this book became 
is an academic uh, exercise, and it's a it's a rigorously academic book. But given my age, <laughs> um, it resonated for me, and uh, it's a it's an older man reflecting back on what life means and what his life has meant, and what he might be looking forward to. He did, he, he, get, he delivered the Ingersoll Lecture in 1906, and the Ingersoll Lecture series still exists. It's at Harvard, and it's on immortality. And he wrote about immortality, but the title of the thing was The Hope for Immortality. He, had, he was not certain that, that it was there. And so he's grappling with that. So I thought it was, um, it humanized him maybe more than the rest of my book had. Mm. And a friend of mine and I visited Baker's Island this um, this uh, summer and looked for perhaps the ledge that he wrote this poem uh, supposedly from. It's a part of uh, Acadia National Park now, and you can take a tour out there. So it's a it's a beautiful poem, and he alludes to. And what's interesting, so it was published in September. Of, he wrote it. The one I found that was dated was September of 1917. So the U.S. is only in the war mm -hmm. five or six months. We went we went in April. There's a reference in that poem to, you know, me in great disesteem by the angry world at this point. So that was evidence to me that he was already getting grief for his position uh, against the war. But I hadn't found, I still hadn't found any of the of the abuse that he took. The abuse he mm. took was really later that, that I could find. But clearly, there was something else going on earlier, or he wouldn't have written that. So it was. I, I thought it was a way to personalize them and uh and it's a beautiful poem sure someone else is asking and you touched on this a, a little bit in your talk um did you come across anything that would enlighten us about his attitudes um towards indigenous peoples native americans that's a good or, question or non-european immigrants like people people from china or japan or well, yeah, you know, he was appalled by the treatment of, of the of the Chinese. Mm -hmm. um, it's a good question, and I may be remiss this. I came across, I mean, this guy was so prolific. After working on this guy for eight years, and I mean almost every day, for a portion of every day, I kept finding things he wrote down to the very end. I said, damn it, yeah. I'm done. <laughs> but he, I did see once or twice um, him at a some sort of, conference or something about Native Americans, but I never followed that up. I probably should have. I was just uh, exhausted. Sure, yeah. There's a there's there's a lot. There's a lot there. So maybe yeah, that's no, so I don't I don't know. Too. I suspect I mean look, his 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 posture towards the but look, the Native Hawaiians were Native a Native Americans. Yes, and, yeah. So that's he, he mm -hmm. said that their government was preposterous. Yeah. You know, I mean he thought and he so he was no multiculturalist. Mm -hmm, you know? mm -hmm. um, part of his whole civic education thing was to Americanize mm -hmm. immigrants. And certainly right, that was a right. part of his temperance campaign because mm -hmm. alcohol was so central, particularly to the Irish in Boston. Mm -hmm. They were in Jamaica Plain. So there was that. But he was no xenophobe. But he was not a, you know, 21st century multiculturalist. Sure, sure, yeah. So, so but anyway, probably should have spent more time digging into if he said anything more, if he said anything at all about Native Americans. Mm -hmm. I suspect, I suspect he would have probably, this is just a guess, been okay with the schooling, you know, the Native Americans were taking right, them. Right. He mm -hmm. would have been okay with that. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I think at the time there were a lot of folks that saw that as a progressive they did. thing. They um, did. But to, you know, today, Oh no no absolutely yeah not, not, absolutely. not absolutely. I mean you opened up your the, 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 this thing with you know, right right a very different give a de very different view right and you know he's not a not a he's not a twenty first century multiple no book. no what's interesting is you know Franz Boa and others at Columbia anthropology was, were beginning to raise issues about cultural relativism if Dole was aware of any of that I I, I never came across. Mm -hmm. it. Someone else is asking, did he ever meet John Dewey or have views on his educational philosophy? Yeah, that's a good question. I I don't recall. I don't think so. I just don't think so. I don't ever remember any reference to John Dewey at all. And that's interesting because Dewey was a towering figure. So. Mm. Someone else is asking, 
So he visited Hawaii after the overthrow of the monarchy when his son had started the pineapple business. Did he write it all about that experience? Yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> it's so this is another thing that complicates his portrait as a anti-imperialist. In the summer of 1889, James had graduated from Harvard and he's, you know, casting about what am I gonna do with my life? Well, he's got a he's got a cousin out who's, who's at this point in 1899, he's uh He's um, about to be appointed territorial governor of, of Hawaii. So he's a powerful position. So he decides to go to Hawaii, doesn't know exactly what he's going to do, but he's part of his education was in agriculture. So that's, he was encouraged to go out there. And Charles was very supportive of that. And um, Charles, then the plantation was established and flowered, et cetera. And Charles never, ever, wrote, and so far as I know, saw any problem with that. Mm. He was always a support, he was the proud, supportive father. And later when he would, they would go frequently, he and Francis, once Charles retired, they'd go to Hawaii to visit, you know, their son and their his growing family. They had, he and his wife had done five or six kids. At one point, Dole wrote about the good that the missionaries had done in Hawaii. Now that is, you know, Again, that's something that really jars with our contemporary sensibilities. Right. But even at that time, I would have really flown in the face of Native Hawaiian perspectives. Mm. So, you know, it's um, it's it's a uh, I've written about him in a, in a it, it, he's, he's a complicated uh, figure. Was, sure. Was sure. So anyway, yes. Yeah, so he continued to go to Hawaii. And um, even though he didn't like the way his cousin had handled the situation on balance he was favorable to what subsequently mm. needed. and the pineapple plantation as sugar had done before utterly transformed the economy and the ecology of the islands mm. this was totally though was totally tone deaf to anything that remotely approaches cultural imperialism sure, Didn't know sure. his main thing i think with imperialism was the violence associated yes yeah that. Yeah. Someone else uh, asked, so he was an active participant in what was later known as the Hancock County Conferences, which were held in August. So we're talking about a Hancock County, Maine. So that's down, that's Mount Desert Island is in, in Hancock County. So does your research touch upon his activity? Like if someone reads this book, do you talk no, about not, not much. I no. mean, I know. So they summered every, you know, every pretty much every year on, at their cottage in Southwest Harbor. Um, he would preach there. He was engaged in some other activities there. That's about all I know about. Mm. So, no, no, but he was also a, he was an act, an active outdoors person. There was a trail that went from the the uh, the, the water the, the the water line up over what uh, was then called Dog Mountain. It was called the Dole Trail. You know, he was involved in some outdoor activities there. He preached there. But other than that, I don't know much about his activities. Mm. Do Does anything survive um, from his wife? Did she write about their lives? Their, but, their you know, I, not much. No, I that was one of my major frustrations. She would yeah. appear sometimes at events that he was at. Pretty much... Um, no, it, it was, I kept looking. Um, you know, she was the dutiful preacher's wife and she mm -hmm. was engaged to some extent. There was a club in, Bo in, uh, in um, civically engaged club called the Tuesday Club in, in um, Jamaica Plain, but I didn't find much. Yeah, yeah, that's too bad. Well, no. thank you again. We're, we're approaching the end of our time together. Um, thank you so much. This is, a, again, a really interesting uh talk on someone that i'm curious to learn more about and if folks if you're interested in the book i've shared the link again where you can purchase a copy so thank you again uh paul and thank you to our audience for joining us and i hope we see everybody back here soon it was a pleasure thank you very much thank you